What is going on, full-time family? It is time to break down UFC 241. Going down this Saturday, August 17th. Of course, headlined by Daniel Cormier versus Steve Miocic 2. Daniel Cormier won the first fight via first-round KO. Beat Kane, the number one pound-for-pound -pound fighter on the planet, the champion in the two most heaviest weight classes. Daniel Cormier held the light heavyweight and heavyweight title at the same time, which is almost unfathomable considering the weight gap between those two weight divisions. Of course, it's the heaviest weight gap, the largest gap between weights. And so to be able to have success in both of those weight classes is extremely impressive. So Daniel Cormier is looking to rematch Stipe Miocic in what could possibly be the last fight of Daniel Cormier's career as he is getting close to retirement. He's 41 to 41 years old and he promised his family he would retire at 40, which it didn't quite plan out the work out as planned, but he's still close to retirement and I'm sure um, this is going to be one of his last fights of his career. As a matter of fact, if Daniel Cormier loses, this probably will be the last fight of his career, which we got to talk about. I mean, if Daniel Cormier loses this fight, it's so interesting because he would still be in conversation for greatest fighter of all time. I mean, his only losses would be to John Jones, which the first fight was before USADA and the second fight was overturned due to a failed drug test. And then his only other loss would be to Steve Emiotic, a guy that he's already beat. So even if Cormier loses this fight, it's still kind of up in the air whether or not he's better than John Jones or Miocic. You could definitely still make the argument. But if Cormier wins this fight, then I believe he will not retire, and that will set up the ultimate John Jones trilogy and hopefully a heavyweight. At light heavyweight, it wouldn't make any sense, yet for some reason, both fighters want to fight there. I mean, we've already seen it. Even if DC wins at light heavyweight, it doesn't tell the detractors much because John Jones technically already won twice at that weight class, even though one of them was overturned. So fighting at heavyweight is like a fresh slate. It's where Daniel Cormier is undefeated. He was the champion. John Jones never been to heavyweight. There's just so many new variables if these guys would fight at heavyweight. But hey, man, Cormier's got to get through Miocic first. And if he does, we could see that. And if not, we could be seeing Daniel Cormier retire this weekend. Now, that's the main event. I'll give you my prediction after we break down the main card. Of course, it's headlined by Cormier Miocic too, but the co-main event, Anthony motherfucking Showtime Pettis versus Nate motherfucking DS. Are you kidding me? I mean, I would call this the people's main event if every fight on this card wasn't the people's main event. This card is fucking amazing. We haven't got a card like this in a while, and I know why. It's because, if you remember, over the last couple of years, the UFC was stacking cards with multiple title fights. The UFC wouldn't even have a card damn near unless there was two title fights and sometimes three. They, they literally had three title fights on most of their cards in 2017 and 2018, and if not, for sure, too. Now we're seeing a lot of cards with one title fight and a lot of lackluster cards on paper, but that's because all the champions are resting shit. They're all taking vacation. They all just fought like three fucking times within a year. Now they got a lot of money. They want to spend a little bit of it. Let the champs rest, you know, recover. They'll be back to uh, make these cards great again. But as for right now, the UFC did a great job, even with only one title fight. Daniel Cormier versus Steve Bay Miocic. Anthony Pettis versus Nate Diaz. Can't wait for that one. Joel Romero versus Paula Costa. Nobody can wait for that one, except for USADA. Gabriel Benitez versus Sadiq Yusuf. Derek Brunson versus Ian Hines. Those are all good fights. But of course, even on the prelims, we got my motherfucking dog, Devontae Smith, King Cage, taking on Clay Collard, actually. Clay Collard's out of the fight. He's got a new opponent stepping in. His new opponent's name is like Kama, K-H-A-M-A, -A, Worthy, Kama Worthy. 
That's who Devontae Smith is about to be fighting. Rafael Asensio versus Corey Sandhagen. Christos Giagos versus Drakkar Close. Oh, that's going to be a scrap. So, I mean, Rafael Asensio versus Corey Sandhagen. Are you fucking kidding me? Corey Sandhagen could easily be one of the top five bantamweights in the world with the win over Rafael Asensio. He's already been extremely impressive leading up to this point to get his way to the top ten. And so this is a, a real test for Sanhagen. But at the same time, Asensio, he's on the way kind of down. And Sanhagen's on the way up. So if Asensio, I mean, loses this, it's just a really good fight for Corey Sanhagen. Because it's a really good test. It's a winnable fight against Asensio. But at the same time, it, it's a really big name. So, I mean, this is I love that fight. It's going to see if Corey Sanhagen's ready for the top five and if Rafael Sunsau is still top five caliber. This is a really, really good fight right here. Corey Sanhagen versus Rafael Sunsau. Christos Giagos versus Jakar Close. Manny the undefeated Bermudez versus Casey Kenny. That's going to be a good fight. Manny Bermudez, 14-0, and 0, submitted all three of his first UFC opponents. Now he's taking on Casey Kenny, who's a legit prospect, fought talented guys. He even beat former UFC title challenger Bray Borg in his UFC debut. So Casey Kenny is no slouch. That's a great fight. All the way up to the early prelims, Jody Esquibel versus Hannah Cyphers, Kyung Ho Kang versus Brandon Davis, whose teammates with Jason Knight since always sure to bring the fun. Shanna Dobson versus Sabina Mazo. So we got some good fights on the card. For this video's purpose, we're just going to break down the main card, main event. And usually, um, I especially recently, I haven't been able to even look at the full cards, let alone the main cards, because I've had so much work. But, I mean, I've got work this week, and this card is super stacked. So I'm going to for sure break down this main card, you know, regardless. But... With that being said, let's jump straight into the first fight of the night of the main card, which is between Derek Brunson and what's the guy's name on Walter White off of um, Breaking Bad, the fucking drug lord? It's Ian Heinish. Derek Brunson versus Ian Walter White Heinish over here. I mean, this guy's got some crazy story. I remember before his last fight, he, like, used to be in some Mexican prison for drug trafficking. Like, craziness, man. Like, a really interesting story. But he's got some good wrestling, which is always makes for a great fighter. And he's taking on Derek Brunson, who is the big biggest task Ian Heinish has fought thus far in his career, for sure. Derek Brunson has been fighting the best fighters in the world. I mean... The whole time he's been in the UFC pretty much, which has been a long time. Even before anybody knew who Derek Brunson was, he fought Yoel Romero, Jocker Ray. And when he fought Yoel Romero, who's one of the best wrestlers in the middleweight division, and Yoel Romero was even younger. And Derek Brunson was the one taking D Yoel Romero down in their fight. If it wasn't for some meddling third-round knockout, Yoel Romero could have easily beat or, uh, he could have easily lost to Derrick Brunson, but he was able to get that KO. He was able to get the finish, and so Derrick Brunson's takedowns and his impressive fight against Yoel didn't pan out, but Derrick Brunson is a beast. I mean, the last two fighters he lost to, Israel Adesanya and Jacare, two of the best middleweights in the world, not close. So Derrick Brunson has been fighting the best middleweights in the world, Ian Heinish, has been trying to prove he is ready to fight the best middleweights in the world. And this will be his first real test. In this fight, who am I going to put the green check on? Let's get the green check on the screen. We're going to give this fight to Derek Brunson. Derek Brunson, he's coming off a win over Elias Theodoru after those losses. But I can't pick against Derek Brunson, man. He's way too high level. I mean... Ian Heinish, could he win this fight? Yes, anything can happen in mixed martial arts, but I'm not going to pick somebody that hasn't, isn't proven, hasn't proven near enough to beat a guy that is battle-tested, battle-worn. It's not like Derek Brunson, some 42-year-old man, you know, with a graying beard and graying hair, let's, you know, pass this prime. No, still extremely athletic, still extremely experienced, still extremely dangerous. So I'm definitely going to be giving the edge to Derek Brunson to win this fight. But I am definitely looking forward to it. Moving on to Gabriel Benitez versus Sadiq Yusuf. Man, this is a really good fight right here. Because Super Sadiq Yusuf has just 
been passing every test with flying colors since I've started watching him since the Contender Series, the UFC. He's looked extremely impressive. I mean, he's got one loss in his career, and it's before the UFC, and it's honestly a little surprising, but you know how it goes. This is MMA. Anything can happen. You can use, lose a split decision. You can get caught in a submission. Anything can for sure happen in this game where everything goes. But Sadiq Yusuf is going to be taking on Gabriel Benitez, who I believe is coming off wins over Jason Knight um, and, and other guys around that level. So I'll pull up Gabriel Benitez's tapology just to be super safe. Gabriel Benitez. Normally I take a lot of notes for all of my predictions, especially if I'm going to be betting on the fights as far as the fake money, you know, or or DraftKings or anything. But um, this week I just straight looked at the fights, did my research, but I didn't really take notes on it when I was making my predictions, and so I'm going back now. So he's coming off a win over Jason Knight and Umberto Bandene. Gabriel Benitez is. But he's got losses in the UFC to Andre Feely, Enrique Barzola. He's also got wins in the UFC over Clay Collard and Sam Cecilia. So he's got some legit UFC experience. He's been with the UFC since 2014. But all the guys on his record so far are not even ranked caliber fighters. Now, Jason Knight, Umberto Bandene, there's some fun prospects, but Jason Knight came to the UFC and as fun and marketable and enjoyable as he was, he went on like a four-fight losing streak and ended up in the bare-knuckle boxing arena. So I like Jason Knight. He's got a really good rubber guard, and it seems like some good jiu-jitsu, but it's for sure a winnable fight, and I for sure think Sadiq Yusuf would do the same thing and win that fight. Umberto Bandene. He's a guy that's a decent fighter. I think he just lost over the weekend to a guy making his debut. But Umberto Bandene is a decent fighter. He's not a good fighter. He's not a ranked fighter. But he's a good fighter. He's a decent fighter. And so, Gabriel Benitez has been beating decent fighters, but not guys that I really rate. And so, with that being said, he's going to be taking on Sadiq Yusuf, who I do rate. I mean, Sadiq Yusuf is a stud. He beat Shaman Marais, who, in my opinion, is a more talented fighter than the guys so far that Gabriel Benitez has fought. Suman Mokhtarian, not so much, but he did knock him out in the first round while he was undefeated. He fought Mike Davis on the Contender Series. Before that, he wasn't fighting really UFC caliber guys. But he did have fucking one, two, three, four, five, six, seven fights as an amateur where he was dominant. So Sadiq Yusuf seems to be a dominant fighter on the rise. Like I said, he does have one slip up on his record where he did lose. He got slammed and knocked out. But if you get rocked, of course, you know they can follow up and finish you. So I'm not sold on Sadiq Yusuf to the point that I was sold on like a Kamaru Usman. But I do think he should be able to get this win in here against Gabriel Benitez. This fight, I do believe, is a close call. I would not be surprised if Gabriel Benitez pulled it off. But for my prediction, I am going to give the edge to Super Sadiq Yusuf. We will see how it goes. Can't wait for that fight. Yoel Romero versus Paulo Costa. Check marks in the bright place, guys. Even though, I mean, picking you, Paulo Costa against Yoel Romero is almost illogical. In my opinion, Paulo Costa has not put in enough work groundwork, I mean, he hasn't proven enough for us to, for him to really even be in this fight, let alone, but I mean, he's got the whole Mackenzie Dern, Paige Van Zant, Sage Northcutt thing going on, you know what I'm saying, where he's extremely attractive, pause, and so he's going to get opportunities where other fighters wouldn't, he's marketable, he sells tickets, he gets, head he does all of that, so Paulo Costa, of course, is going to get pushed, um, Yo Romero, on the other hand, is 42 years old, fought for the title multiple times, now, uh, amazing Cuban wrestler, explosive, powerful, um, proven he's at the top of the division, beat the highest contenders, I mean, Yo Romero is a big monster, 
and one of the best middleweights in the world. The thing is, Yoel Romero, I believe, is now 42 years old, and Father Time loses to no man. Even though Yoel Romero looks like he might be fighting to a split decision with Father Time, because this man's already defying um, all logic when it comes to body types at 42 at this age. You know what I'm saying? So, Yoel's a great fighter. The only reason that I'm picking against him is I believe he's got a lot going. It's really the intangibles. I mean, if you're talking about wrestling, you got to give the edge to Yoel Romero. And normally, that'd be enough. If you're talking about an elite wrestler versus a hyped-up newcomer, usually I'm taking the elite wrestler every time. The thing about Yoel is he doesn't really use like his wrestling throughout the entire fight. He'll, he'll use the wrestling. He's got great takedown defense. But really, it seems like he just conserves his energy for the first couple of rounds and manages to explode in that third round. And that's when, he, when people are cut off guard. They expect he's tired, and they're a little tired, and that's when he fucking explodes and just knocks motherfuckers silly in that third round. So, Yo Romero, extremely deceiving fighter. This, for me, is a pretty much a toss-up. The only reason I'm giving the edge to Paulo Costa is because intangibles, and also because I believe that is best-case scenario for the UFC. Um, so, that's also helping my decision because... I know in a perfect world, the UFC would, like, I believe, like Paulo Costa to win this fight. He's younger. He's marketable. Um, it would immediately put him in title shot contention, and he could fight guys like Israel Adesanya. So I'm picking Paulo Costa. Yo, Romero, the intangibles. He's 42 years old. Um, he's just won a $27 million lawsuit, which I'm sure he hasn't seen the money from yet. But it is something to keep on the back of your mind. I mean, how motivated are you to go in there and cage fight if you think you got $27 million on the way? You know what I'm saying? So I do think um, is if those stories pan out as far as the $27 million, because I have seen a couple people say that they don't know if Yoel's even going to get to touch any of that money, which that would be kind of crazy. Um, either way, that's definitely a reason to get your mind off the game if you've you know, just won a lawsuit for $27 million. you're 42 years old, you're coming off two losses in the title shots, so, I mean, unless you are Merrill plans on moving up to 205, there's not a lot more for him to do, except for maybe pass the torch, so, I'm going Yoel Romero to lose this fight against my, you know, against the normal logic I use of picking a fight, so they their resumes, their styles, and everything. For me, this fight is also intangibles. Of course, Paulo Costa's dangerous. We know he fucking hits dudes with bricks, so he could also just finish your well. But it's interesting to me, even in these pictures we're looking at on UFC.com, doesn't it look like Yoel is just bigger than Paulo Costa? It almost looks like Yoel is taller and bulkier than than Paulo just from this picture. So yeah, I, mean, I cannot wait for this fight. I'm sure you guys can't either. I mean, hide your wives, hide your daughters. Um, but yeah, this is going to be a great fight. Anthony Pettis versus Nate Diaz. Check mark in the right place. You guys are like, what? He's picking Paulo Costa and Nate Diaz. Is this guy fucking crazy? Actually, I'm not. I do believe Nate Diaz is going to win this fight, and if you don't, I don't believe you watched Nate Diaz versus Michael Johnson, and I don't think you knew everything that went into that fight. I mean, whenever Nate Diaz came back and fought Mike, Michael Johnson, even before McGregor, which is why a lot of you guys probably didn't even fuck with Nate Diaz before that, because if you remember, Nate Diaz was really known as Nick Diaz's little brother. I mean, they were the Diaz brothers, but Nick Diaz was the prominent Diaz brother before the McGregor fight. And so when Nate Diaz fought Michael Johnson, Nate Diaz was coming off the couch then. Nate Diaz, it took like a year off before the Michael Johnson fight, and he came back and looked better than I had ever seen him look before. I mean, when Nate fought Michael Johnson, Michael Johnson was coming off of a robbery loss, I believe, to a Benil Dariush. And that was a fight that, that fight made me really root for Michael Johnson at the time because whenever I see somebody get robbed, I'm like, hell no, that's crazy. They deserve that win, and they literally just got robbed of their livelihood. And so it was at a time where I was like, okay, okay, I got my eye on Michael Johnson. Let me check him out. You know, he just got robbed. I'm rooting for him. Man, Nate Diaz must have came in there and put them motherfucking paws all over Michael Johnson. It didn't matter how angry Michael Johnson got. 
how much fight IQ he tried to use. Nate D, he could do nothing to Nate Diaz. Just hands, hands, just box, boxing his ass up. It was fucking amazing from Nate Diaz. And so, that was off of a layoff. So I know Nate Diaz can come off of a layoff and do fine. You know, his cardio is always going to be good no matter the layoff. He's been posting uh, videos of triathlons. Excuse me. He's been posting videos of him in triathlons and stuff like that. So Nate's been staying ready, and you know what they say. If you stay ready, you don't got to get ready. And so I believe Nate Diaz will win this fight. I know it's some people think it's um, not going to happen. A lot of people are picking Pettis, especially if you're talking about momentum. I mean, the momentum going into these fights, Nate Diaz has just about none. I mean, he's not been fighting at all, not really doing much, so he doesn't have momentum as far as the fight game is concerned. Anthony Pettis does. This man's just Superman punched Wonderboy Thompson and knocked him out. What? I mean, it's not as impressive as his jumping off the cage head kick KO over Benson Henderson, which still doesn't get enough credit. But it is extremely impressive to, for one, be able to knock out Wonder Boy, and for two, with the Superman punch. So, Anthony Pettis has the momentum. He's a really good fighter, former lightweight champion. These guys have a history. They've never liked each other. Nate Diaz, all the way back to when Anthony Pettis was the champion and fought Nate Diaz's good friend Gilbert Melendez. These guys have never fucked with each other. So this is a really good fight. I'm so happy it's finally happening. And I believe the winner of this fight will move on to potentially face Conor McGregor. But we shall see. If Pettis wins, we could be seeing Pettis versus McGregor. If Diaz wins, we could be seeing Diaz versus McGregor 3. Winner takes on Khabib. So we shall see, man. But this is another great fight with that means a lot. I mean, could set up huge fights. Both of these guys are two of the most established lightweights in the UFC's history that also fight at 170 now and they both look good at 170 so I cannot fucking wait for this fight we're only three sleeps away from UFC 241 and it's gonna be fucking amazing so let's move on to the main event <sighs> the main event is easily the hardest fight for me to pick on this card you guys I hate this it's so hard Daniel Cormier versus Stipe I mean, in the first fight I picked Stipe, I had one of my friends tell me, man, you're fucking crazy. I'm taking Daniel Cormier. They even put up money on Daniel Cormier. I said, is this motherfucker crazy? You just got money to lose. Like, you, you, How can you be confident enough? And then now, I mean, of course, hindsight's twenty twenty. It makes sense now. Daniel Cormier was like a minus 240 underdog. My homie fucking, you know what I'm saying? He bet like 50 bucks, made some good change off of that. Steve Bimmy I mean, the longest reigning heavyweight champion in UFC history now. First fight had controversy. There was eye pokes. Daniel Cormier landed probably three or four eye pokes. Steve landed one or two himself, though. So, I mean, there were eye pokes back and forth. We didn't get to see much fighting and then a quick knockout. So... We have no way of knowing exactly how this fight's going to play out. All I would say is it would be really cool if whoever's referee in this fight, before the fight, got to say, Hey guys, I'm watching eye pokes. No, no fucking tolerance on eye pokes in this fight. I mean, there's too much eye poke controversy in the first fight, so I'm letting you guys know now. First warning, no eye pokes. Put them motherfuckers on first warning as soon as they get in there. Woo! That's what they need to do for John Jones. Hey, bro, you got a history of eye pokes. Cut that shit out. You, you ain't getting no warnings. You do it, you're losing points. But yeah, Cormier versus Miocic. Who am I going to pick to win this fight, man? It goes one of two ways. Either Daniel Cormier wins or he loses and retires. I seen a video from American Kickboxing Academy with Daniel Cormier and Khabib and they were training and there was a lot of guys around and they were having fun as usual. And Daniel Cormier told him, After I lose or after I lose this next fight, you'll be the number one pound for pound. He was like, After I lose, I'll retire and you can be number one pound for pound after this fight. But he was saying it as if he already had it planned out, like when I lose, 
I'm going to retire, and it'll make you number one pound for pound. But right now, I'm still number one pound for pound. And in my head, I'm thinking, like, why would he even be putting that in his mindset? Like, why is he even thinking about if I lose or, you know, well, I'll retire? Like, hold on, man. We shouldn't even be thinking about losing. We're going in here to win. How about after I fucking get done with my whole career, I'll retire, and you can be number one pound for pound. Or after I beat Stipe, then I'll go fight Jones, then I'll retire. He said, after I lose, I'll retire, and you'll be number one pound for pound. But he was talking about after the Stipe fight, so... That kind of has me a little skeptical of if Cormier is going to win this fight or not. Um, this is such a toss-up for me, guys. Like I'm kind of making my prediction here on the spot, so bear with me. I, this is a fight I don't want to make a prediction for, but I'm going to because I'm not a beta male. All right, guys, I'm picking Daniel Cormier to get the job done. He's been more active. Uh, Stipe has been taking a little bit of a break. He didn't fight anybody, did he? Since losing this title, I don't think he's fought anybody. Um, but I'm not super confident that this is a flip and a coin. Like, I'm really leaning towards Stipe Miocic here. I really am, guys. But Daniel Cormier, as of right now, greatest fighter of all time, pound for pound. I got to pick him to win. I can't pick against him. I'm going Daniel Cormier, but anything can fucking happen. And if Stipe wins, I will not be even close to surprise. But if he, Stipe Miocic does win, I'll predict it right here, right now for you guys. Daniel Cormier will retire at UFC 241. And with that being said, it is what it is. Hope you guys enjoyed this breakdown and the, my predictions. Usually, I feel like they're a lot more better. I put, I do even more research and I take notes and I read off my notes. This was kind of just off the cuff, off the top of my head. Because it's such a big card, I did want to put a video out for the full-time family that is not already in our Discord. If you are in our Discord, you already know that I've already posted my full fight card predictions over there, all the way from the early prelims. So if you want to join Discord, just click the link in the description. There's no paywall. It's 100% free. I don't even know if you have to download the app. You can probably just go there from your app, from your web app. So join the Discord. Join the conversation. Give your predictions. Man, there's better comedy in our Discord on a daily basis than you're probably going to find anywhere else. Like, not to brag, but our Discord is fucking lit, guys. Click the link in the description. It is what it is. Let the full-time family know what you think in the comments. Don't be a beta male. I'm out.